you people up a little bit. This is exciting. <laughs> this is a chance to worship Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen? Amen? Okay, that's great. That's better. Welcome to Prairie Bible Church. My name is Tom Hughes. It's my privilege just to be able to open our service this morning and welcome you here. If you are new to Prairie Bible Church, welcome. We're glad you found us. We're looking forward to a chance to just worship together and to be brothers and sisters in Christ this morning. The Bible taught us in Matthew that where two or more are gathered, Jesus is with us. The Holy Spirit is here. And I hope that you can feel him this morning as we get to celebrate and worship together. I'm going to go ahead and start around our clipboards. we got one on each side. If you'd be willing to just put your name down, and also there's a place for an email in there, that if you haven't put your email down with us, please share that. And we have a weekly email that comes out just to know about some of the details that are going on here at PBC and activities that you can get involved in or ways that you can plug in and know uh, what's going on a little bit better. The other thing I want to highlight quickly is up on the board I'll put up here is a Connect Gathering. Um, once a month, we have a Connect Gathering, the last Sunday of the month, right after the second service, about 11.15, to just talk about PBC. So if you are newer to the church, and or if you've been around a while, but just have questions about our history, maybe our foundation, what our beliefs are, we encourage you to come to that. Open to anybody that wants to come. Just stick around the last Sunday of the month. A couple of leaders from the church will just talk a little bit about PBC and be able to have that conversation and answer questions that you might have as we get to know each other better and make sure this is where God is calling you to be. Um, now, I want to highlight uh, every week we put kind of the ministry notes and a little handout on the sheets. And on one side, just kind of some information about PBC. It's not all inclusive. There's more on our website and that email, but some of the details that are going on. And then on the back side are the sermon notes. Many of you know, although he's never up front, Mark Steffens, who usually runs the sound booth and he's been here all, since the very beginning of PBC and he helps in so many ways we can't take all morning to talk about it. 
One of the simple things he does is even put together brochures. They're the little pamphlets that we can have those notes every week. And we are so thankful for everything Mark does in every week and every day. And so they took a very uh, deserved vacation this week. So we printed these without his help. <laughs> They're last week's sermon notes. Sorry. <clears throat> I apologize for the notes. Um, this to just help you appreciate Mark that much more next week when he comes back and tell him you thank him for all the great work he does behind the scenes that we don't realize. And as you're taking notes, don't get mad at Craig. He's not just going off the deep end. He really is preaching today's sermon, even though it doesn't follow this, okay? So you'll have to take your own notes today. We apologize for that. But I want to let everybody know. Uh, the other thing I want to highlight just a little bit, we've been talking about this month, uh, His Hands Free Medical Clinic. That is, we highlight our spotlight for the mission uh, each month, that we had a video last week to just talk about what they're doing in the community and how they're helping. And I hope and ask that you will include them in your prayer life this week and the rest of this month, just to lift them up as we support them uh, as, as what they're doing in our community and what they're doing for God. If you have more questions about them, there's a bro, uh, brochures out on the uh, signboard out in the hallway. I want to help, encourage you to get involved there if that's something that's really tugging on your heart as a way to get involved and help them in maybe volunteering or in financial contributions or whatever it might be. So I want to highlight that each and every week as we're going. The other thing I want to just uh, hit on again uh, briefly this morning is life groups. We occasionally talk about that here at PBC. But that's been one of our core foundations. That while it's awesome to come here on a Sunday morning and be able to fellowship and have coffee together, it's tough to have deeper conversation and to get to know somebody better or really ask questions about faith and purpose and what the Bible is saying. That's what the life groups are for. We've got a short little video again to talk about how some people here at PBC feel about life groups. Life group to me is a bunch of people who don't have it all together being able to come into a room and admit that to each other. Um, it's where you can act yourself and let your guard down, where you can talk to Shane and all of his conspiracy theories and get to enjoy that every week and just have something to look forward to. What life group is to me is uh, saying something in your life group that's socially awkward and you hear that silence and then other, the good people in your life group um, come and rescue you by saying kind words or bringing up a Bible passage. <laughs> when I think of life group, what comes to mind first for me is um, it's just like having your extended family at church with you. And it's a group of people who I feel comfortable with, who I can um, look to for support and encouragement, um, even just to bounce ideas off of. Um, and on Sunday morning, it's like I have my people there and I feel at home, like I have a place and not just like I'm another face in the crowd. What Life Group means to me is a place you can let your hair down, just relax and be with friends. Life Group to me is uh, creating friendships with my church family. Life Group is my family with Christ-centered, um, the people that I turn to when I'm celebrating, the people I turn to when I'm in need of help, that's what Life Group is to me. Yeah, life Group to me is spending time with friends, it really is something to look forward to, and um, it's people who can hold us accountable and motivate us to grow in our faith and get into things that I want to get started like reading my bible more and just prayer and they're that group there to help support us life group really truly is the best it's a good chance to spend time with like-minded people close friends of ours that are in the church that's all centered around jesus and our faith and the bible and it's a good chance to build those relationships outside of the actual church setting and it's really truly one of my favorite parts of life group to me is family Ultimately, what Life Group means to me is I think of the verse in Proverbs, iron sharpens iron, and that's what I hope we do for each other. What does Life Group mean to you? Hey, church, 
Have you met my family, my church family? This is my life group. You think maybe you're missing out on something because this is great. You want to be connected, see our pastors, see what's going on in our church. There's nothing better than getting with the people here and living life with them. Kate, what's life group? <laughs> So if you, if you like people, if you love the idea of getting together and being able to conversate, hold each other accountable, you love to learn more about Jesus and about how you can grow your faith, or if you just like pizza, either way, Life Group is for you. Uh, so we hope that you would plug in. We know a lot of people are involved in it. It's been a great foundation here at PBC, and we want to encourage everybody to think about it. And there's a lot of different Life Groups that go on at all different times of the week, all different times of day, that there is a Life Group for you. So if you are still interested, although it can be a nervous thing uh, to try to get involved in that initially, um, I will also echo that it can be just as nervous for the life group leaders to, to go out and invite somebody in. So it's a, uh, it's a mutual thing that's tough. But once you take that first step, it's amazing the relationships it can build, as you can hear there. And there's usually great food, too, so you can't beat that. I hope that you will consider it and get a hold of somebody to get more involved. Uh, as we follow into a worship time, I would love to open us in prayer, if you'd join me this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for the chance to come together as family, as was so poignantly talked about on that video. Each Sunday is a chance to gather with brothers and sisters, to love one another and to support one another, and, and let us never take that for granted, the chance that we get to be together, to be with you and to be brothers and sisters and children of God. What an awesome, awesome gift that you've given us, Lord. When we come into this space, as I mentioned earlier, we know that your spirit is here because where two or more are gathered, you are with us. Thank you, Lord, for joining us this morning. Thank you for being here, for surrounding us with your love. And Lord, I pray that as we come through these doors into this space, I pray that we've left the outside world out there. Because I know there's distractions. This world is a cruel, sinful, challenging, disgusting place. Lord, and let us be, let us leave that at the door so that we can come in here and and be truly children, innocent, loving, pure children of God, that we can focus our attention on you this morning as you so greatly deserve, that we can love our Lord, our Creator, our Savior, and our Jesus, and that those problems can stay out there. Lord, and we ask that you would guide us and love us this morning, that the songs that we sing would bring music to your ears, and the words that we hear would become from you soak into us and allow it to guide us and direct us, not only today, but in the days and the weeks and the months and the years to come. We ask all this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand and sing again. It's all 
all about you. It's all about you, Jesus.
we just thank you for the empty things in our life we thank you for the empty cross we thank you for the empty tomb and we thank you that you can fill empty hearts lord we just pray that uh this service would be glorifying to you and that everything we say and we do would just be for your glory and for the edifying of the saints and for everyone here and for all those that are watching online lord i just pray for pastor craig that you would give him the message this morning and it'd be your word spoken through him i just lift him up to you in your name amen As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship thee. You alone are my strength, my shield, to you alone may our spirit yield. You alone are our heart's desire, and we long to worship Thee. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's have the kids come forward. Uh, if you're new to uh, Prairie Bible, what we do is we have our kids come up, and we ask you as the church to stand a hand of blessing towards them as they head off for uh, their life groups. Um, so if you would do that, extend a hand towards our children. Lord Jesus, thank you for my brothers and my sisters and the privilege that we have to be the church with them. We're asking, Lord, as they go off to learn and grow as disciples, that your spirit would go with them and that you would take the word of God and root it and ground it in them and may it produce fruit in them as well. And, and I'm praying the very same thing for us as we have gathered in this place um, to, to study scripture and to learn your purpose and your plan for us as well as adults. We are the church together. The children are not the church of tomorrow. They are the church of today. And together with them, we aspire, Lord, to be Jesus to the world. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Head on that way. <laughs> Two of my granddaughters. I mean, they all love me like that, but those are my granddaughters. There's a lot to love, is that what you said? Oh, oh, very good. Randy, I love you. <laughs> um, many, many years ago, I was a pastor in Davenport, as some of you know, and the church was growing, and it was an exciting place to be. Well, there, one of the visitors that we had during that season was a, a woman who had 
uh, migrated from Texas to Iowa, and I found out um, um, that first day that she worshiped with us that she was a Southern Baptist from Texas who had immigrated to Iowa. Um, and we, as we met, we, of course, we were hoping that she would um, have, find this to be her place for God's place for her. And um, even though she was not, that church happened to be Methodist and it wasn't her tradition, it was in the neighborhood and it was convenient and she hoped that that would be a place for her. And I hoped so too, we hoped so, and she was greeted warmly. And um, on that first Sunday she was with us, um, I started to preach. And as I started to preach, her Southern Baptist came out because she began engaging me with amens. Remember that, Elizabeth? Uh huh. And I was thrilled. Because it wasn't a part of that, tradi- the ch- that church's tradition for people to say amen, but I had always dreamed about serving a church that where people, when they were led by the Spirit, that they would feel comfortable enough to, to affirm what was being spoken by the Spirit with an amen. So, that's a word of encouragement for all of you, okay? If you feel the, if you feel the urge, go for it, all right? Um, well, as it turned out, she, was, she felt welcomed and she felt like that's where God wanted her to be, so that became her church home. Um, but what I discovered was, as time passed, um, some of her amens weren't necessarily spirit-led. I'll, give you, I'll tell you what I mean. So what, what I was beginning to discover from her was that it was more of a rhythmic thing for her. So I'm, I, I'm a hoping and presuming that some of the times she said amen, she meant it. But oftentimes it was just because I took a pause in the sermon, she would take the opportunity to say amen. And um, when I began to realize that that's what she was doing, because, you know, there's sometimes I, I wonder if, she, if I said, hey, I'm going to the bathroom, would she say amen? <laughs> so I, I began kind of, kind of changing up my rhythm, you know, to see if I could throw her off a little bit. And it became kind of this, this competition between the two of us. And, and um, I soon began to understand that it was becoming a distraction for the two of us and for everybody else, too. Um, I tell that story to you this morning because um, it's, it illustrates the fact that sometimes good things can become a distraction from the main thing. And when good things become a, a distraction from the main thing, they actually become not so good things, right? Well, this morning, as we continue our journey through Paul's letters to the Corinthians, um, what we discover is that a very similar thing was happening in the Corinthian church. There were things happening in that church that were a distraction from the main thing. Now, if you've read ahead, anybody read ahead into uh, 1 Corinthians 14? Anybody? Raise your hands if you have. Don't have to if you don't want to. But if you have, you are aware that there are some. There is one particular distraction. There's more than one distraction identified here in 14, but there's one particular distraction that over the years has um, kind of taken on a life of its own in the church universal, um, and thus it has become a, a unique distraction from the main thing, in my opinion. Um, so I want to, since we don't have the right sermon notes for you today, um, I want, you're going to really need to have your Bibles open. So if you haven't already done it, take your Bibles out um, and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Um, if you're using one, of the, if you don't have a Bible, that's okay. We got lots of uh, Bibles here. In fact, as Billy likes to say, we love it when our Bibles go missing. If you don't have a Bible at home, even if you do and you want another one, take that Bible you're using home with you, Okay. But 1 Corinthians 14, starting at verse 26, is found on page 1,141 of those church Bibles, by the way, if you were looking for it and wondering where it's at. Um, Let me give you a little bit of a a refresher as we move in. You'll recall the first part of 1 Corinthians 14, we were talking about spiritual gifts, right? If you were with us last week, you'll remember that. And specifically, what we were talking about is the purpose of of spiritual gifts. Does anybody remember what the purpose of spiritual gifts are? Yell it out if you know it. To build up the church, that's right. The purpose of every spiritual gift is to build up the church. It is to build up people like you and me to become more like Jesus so that we can be Jesus to the world because that is your ultimate purpose. Your ultimate purpose as the church, is to be Jesus to the world. And the purpose of spiritual gifts is to build you up or to prepare you 
to be that to the world, to be Jesus to the world, all right? Well, as we continue on into 1 Corinthians 14, uh, what we discover is that some of those spiritual gifts um, were being exercised within this community of faith in a way that was a distraction from the main thing. And what's the main thing again? To, to build... to to be Jesus, right? To be Jesus to the world. So some people were exercising their spiritual gifts in a way that was distracting attention from Jesus. By the way, anything that you're doing, and not just in worship, anytime something is distracting you, if you are a Christian, if you've accepted Jesus into your heart as Lord and Savior, don't let anything distract you from your main thing, which is to be Jesus to the world. And it could be anything, by the way. Don't let I'm talking about your spouse, your kids, your job, your PlayStation, your your, um, Cardinals. (laughs) Don't let anything distract you from your main thing. Because if your thing is distracting you from the main thing, then it's not a good thing. I could probably stop right there, and I kind of want to, but I'm not going to. Um... Look at verse 26. Verse 26, Paul identifies one of the spiritual gifts that was being used as a distraction in church. It was the gift of tongues. Now that shouldn't surprise you. If you were here last week, you'll know that, that the gift of tongues is, is, was, it was, it's the least of all the gifts. It's a good one, but it's the least of all the gifts because it's self-centered. It's about you and God and does, doesn't involve others. Um, But interestingly enough, another gift is um, lifted up as a distraction as well, and that is the gift of prophecy. Look at verse 29. In verse 29, he identifies prophecy as a distraction, or the way it was being exercised within the church was becoming a distraction to the church from the main thing. In fact, in other words, it had become about the gift rather than about Jesus. Anything that is a distraction from Jesus is not a good thing. Even if it's a good thing by itself, it becomes a bad thing if it distracts you from Jesus. Okay. Paul's advice, when distractions are occurring during worship in particular, his his advice was the same for in both instances. He said, be silent. If the gift of tongues is being exercised in a way that's distracting you from Jesus, be silent. If the gift of prophecy is being used that distracts you from Jesus, be silent. In verse 33, the reason why is because our God is not a God of confusion. Look at verse 33. Our God is not a God of confusion, but a God of peace. And and it's so, Paul is so impressed by the Spirit to to drive that point home. If you look at the very end of the chapter, um, he, he says it again in a different way when he says, when he talks about do everything decently and in order. Why? Because God doesn't put up with distractions. Especially when it's, whatever it is, is distracting you from Him. Make sense? Now, remember earlier when I said there's another distraction that He identifies here? Well, we've come to it. Verse 34. But before we get there, go look. Before we get there, let me say a couple of things to lay a foundation for you to actually hear what I'm going to say to you today. The first thing that I need you to hear is there have been a lot of issues that have raised up, been, that have raised up from this verse and other verses like it that um, I'm not going to be able to address every issue that, have, that is related to this pa- passage. I'm just not, I don't have time today to address every issue that comes from this, this verse and others like it. For example, um, I am not going to address there, that one of the issues that has, been, that has arisen from this interpretation of this verse is that um, women shouldn't be pastors. Some people believe that. I'm, going to tell, I'm not going to address that, but I will let you know as your pastor, as your senior pastor, that um, I actually believe that women can be pastors. And I have a biblical foundation for that. Which leads me to my second point. 
there are good and godly people who disagree with me. There are a lot of good and godly people who disagree with me, and I'm okay with that. As long as you have a biblical foundation upon which your belief is, is, is built, all right? In other words, we can, we can disagree and still love each other. We can disagree and still be a part of the same church. When I'm done today, you've heard what I had to say about this passage of Scripture. Uh, if, if you think, he's full of it, that's okay. I love you. And I hope you'll still love me too. All right? So, you ready to dive in? Some of you are look smirking at me. Or do you just want to call it quits? You want to just stop? Verse 34. Women should be silent in church as the law commands. It may say a little bit different in, your, in the translation you're using, but that's what it says. Women should be silent in church. Um, now, got to remember context, right? What was the context? Just one word. We can describe the context in one word. What was it? Distractions! What is going on here? In this particular context, distractions are occurring in worship. And how did Paul say to deal with the other distractions, whether it was the gift of tongues that was becoming a distraction, or the gift of prophecy? What did he say? Be silent, right? So, in, with this particular distraction, what's his advice? Be silent. Now, again, I would love to just leave it right there and just call it a day and say, go home, have a good lunch, enjoy the day. But to have integrity, we can't leave it right there because of what I was mentioned to earlier, that there are, there are issues and theologies that have grown up out of this verse and others like it that you all have questions about. And I, I feel an obligation to um, share with you my interpretation of it. Um, so, you see, here's the deal, that Paul didn't just say um, women should be silent in church. He used theology to buttress his point, to undergird his point. The question is, what is the theology? He says women should be uh, quiet in church as the law says. Now, I did... I did I've done some research, and quite honestly, I haven't been able to discover personally, I, and I didn't do hours upon hours of research, but I, I, I'm, I couldn't discern what law he was referring to here. Um, there, there, there may be a very good answer to that. I just don't have it, all right? That, I'm ignorant. I'll confess that. Um, so I'm not sure about that, but what I am sure about is this. There were women in the church who were distracting, right? And Paul says, be silent. But when he talks, when he uses this, this um, because as the law requires, he is building a theology for you. And the question is, what is the theology? The essence of it has become known as um, complementarianism, which is a big religious word, uh, which for all intents and purposes means that men and women have been created by God differently. Does that come as a surprise to anybody? It comes as a surprise to some people, by the way. Men and women have been created by God differently with their own strengths and weaknesses generally. All right? which means that there are certain roles that women perform better than men perform because of the way they've been created. And there are certain roles that... that um, what, what did I just say? Women do some better than men. Yeah, vice versa, right? You get what I mean. Interestingly enough, he doesn't, he's not saying that one is better than the other. That's not what it means. That's not what complementarianism means, that one is better than the other. It means that we're different... We have different, because of those differences, we have different roles to fulfill. And ultimately, because they are different, because we are different, and we have different roles to fulfill, 
we actually complement each other when we do those roles, when we fulfill those roles together. Does that make sense? That's complementarianism. There's more to it, obviously, than that, but that's the essence of it. Now, um, because because of all these other things that have arisen out of this verse, there are other things that need to be addressed. For example, there is a biblical truth that um, is kind of the foundation of of, uh, this theology. And the biblical truth, which is unequivocal in my mind, is that the, the husband has been called to fulfill the role of headship or leader of the house. That is the role of the husband according to the Bible. And I don't know how you get around that one. Here's the problem. A lot of husbands are really bad at that. That is an unequivocal truth too. Um, In fact, I would go so far as to say most of us husbands are really bad at that. And when there is a leadership vacuum... It, it, it's filled by something. And what has happened is that women have stepped up and filled the leadership vacuum that had been created by those of us who are bad husbands. Unequivocal truth. But, when we perform the roles, the biblical roles, that God has laid out for us, when we do them the way we're supposed to do them, when we fulfill those roles, the way we were intended to fulfill those roles, then it works beautifully. And that's exactly what Paul was talking about here in chapter 14. Get it back around to that. What he was saying in 14 about women, he's saying, when you have questions, if you have questions, I'm glad you have questions. You should have questions in worship. If the, when the pastor's uh, preaching or teaching something, you should have questions, but don't be a distraction. If you have questions, wait till you get home and share those questions with the head of the house if he's doing his job, which is the husband. Talk about it there. Don't be a distraction. I hope you still love me. I still love you. Um... Here's, here's what I need you to hear from me. This is very, very important. So if you haven't heard anything else, please, and if you've decided to tune me out because you haven't liked what I've said, listen to me now because this is a big deal. You know what the devil does? You know what he's been doing for thousands of years now? When we as the church have allowed ourselves to be distracted by things like this, you know what he's doing? He's standing over in the corner and he's laughing at you. He's going, got him! They're so distracted by that stuff that they forgot the good stuff, the great stuff, the purpose of it all. Which is what? For you to be Jesus to the world. Folks, while we've been stewing over whether or not women should be pastors or whether women should be in leadership in church or whether women should be quiet, the world has been falling apart. Today we live in a world that doesn't know the difference between a man and a woman. Have you been watching the news? And we're over here fiddling while Rome is burning. Listen to this one. Today we live in a world, heard this from a mom who has a high school student in Pleasantville, Iowa. Now I could be wrong. It could be just a, I've heard that this is just an urban legend. But I heard this from a mom who has a student in Pleasantville, Iowa. Little teeny town in Iowa. She told me that in their high school, they have put litter boxes 
in the bathrooms. You want to know why they've put litter boxes in the bathrooms? Because there's some kids that go to school at Pleasantville, Iowa, that don't know whether they are a human or an animal. I think I'm a cat! Now you can giggle at that if you want to. But that is the world that you live in. And we're debating things like what we've talked about today. That is sinful. And the devil laughing at you is proof that it is sinful. The moment anything, I'm not telling you that these that the conversations that I've been that we've been having today or that we've been presenting, I'm not telling you they're not valid conversations. But when that thing takes you from the main thing and then the world is falling apart, it's a bad thing. You have been called to be Jesus to the world. Once you get that one straight as the church, then let's come back and let's talk about this other stuff, okay? In the meantime, get out there and be Jesus to the world because your world is falling apart and there is no hope without Jesus. Somebody needs to say amen. 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 I am not going to be distracted and I'll prove to you that I'm not going to be distracted. If you've been a part of Prairie Bible Church for any length of time, you will know that there has not been one Sunday that has went by when I haven't said to you, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Now, why do I do that every week? Because that is the main thing. You see, it's not good enough for you to come to church. I'm glad you came to church today. I really am. I'm glad. But it's not good enough. It's not good, for, good enough for you to theologize. I'm glad you're thinking deeply enough about Scripture and about God that you're theologizing, but that's not good enough. It is not good enough for you to say that I, my grandpa was a preacher. It is not good enough. You need to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Every one of you need to do that. You need to submit to Him as Lord because He is your only hope. Because if you try to go out into that culture without your eyes fixed upon Jesus, you will fail without submitting to Him as your Lord. You will fail. You need Jesus. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ into your heart as Lord and Savior, maybe today is the day you should. And it would be my privilege to pray that prayer with you. You don't need me to pray that prayer with you. You can do that all by yourself. But I had two or three people at the first service come in there and they said, I think I've done this, but I'm not sure, so can you help me? So I'm going to help you. It, there's no magical words to it. Number one is you confess that you're a sinner. You are, you are messed up. You have sinned. You've made mistakes. And you need to ask God to forgive you. And you know what will happen? Instantaneously, He already has. But that's not the end of it either. You then must make the conscious decision to accept Jesus into your heart as Lord. Which means He's the one that's in charge now, not you. He's in charge. Do, will you allow Him to be in charge? Because that's what lordship means. It means trusting and believing and living and acting like you know and you believe that Jesus is Lord. Not the culture. Not your pastor. Not your mom and dad. But Jesus And when you make that conscious decision, you shall be saved. Not because you are good, but because He is good. Amen? Amen. If you'd like a prayer through Pastor, I'll be right over there.
So I was thinking about saying this during the first service, but I didn't. And I got in my head about it. And kind of like what he was talking about, it was, I feel like I might be a distraction if I talk. And uh, But I'm going to talk about it anyway. So uh, when I was a kid, the first church that we ever went to had like a, a time of prayer requests. And doesn't that sound like a, a really good thing to do in church? Um, the problem was that it started changing into talking about our brokenness instead of talking about God's greatness. And it got down to the point of we're talking about little Jimmy's birthday. Let's sing, sing happy birthday to him. And actually, instead of talking about things that matter. And I think that's a huge thing of what, what are we focusing on? Are, are we focusing on the name of Jesus or are we focusing on our problems? I don't think really focusing on our problems help. Um, and that's why we sing songs like we sang the heart of worship today. Who is the heart of worship? It's Jesus. So that's the next song we're going to sing is, well, who's the name that we're talking about? It's Jesus. So let's sing together this morning. Let's end this service right.
What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. Well, if we've not yet met, my name is Billy. I'm the associate pastor here, and it's been a blessing to worship with all of you. I've got a trivia question for you. What is the middle word of our mission statement? Authentic, right? Let me be authentic with you. I personally, I'm complementarian. I believe that men and women were made equal in value, but differing in roles. And just as Pastor Craig would say for his view, he has biblical reasons uh, for female pastors. My belief, and I have biblical reasons for it, is that men are called to the office of pastor elder. Now, I want to diffuse some tension after saying that. You know who already knew that? Pastor Craig. We've talked about this. So does that mean me as associate pastor that I, I shouldn't or can't submit to Pastor Craig's leadership as senior pastor because we disagree on this? Of course not. Of course not. Because you know what we agree on? That Jesus Christ and him crucified is the main thing. And I think that example in me and Pastor Craig's life is an example of that we are all about simple, authentic Jesus here. That's what matters to us. And so Pastor Craig and I, we would never let that be a distraction from the main thing. And I hope in the church, what you heard this morning is, uh, while these debates go on in the church, let's not lose sight of the main thing. We live in a broken world. Uh, We live in a world where Jesus Christ is not the main thing. And sometimes I look at the church, and I think we've lost sight of that too. And we have debates over these things while we forget to keep Jesus the main thing and to be bright and burning lamps on on a hill for Christ, right? And so as you leave here this morning, let's keep our unity so that we can keep our testimony to the world no matter where we disagree on our theology. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you so much for Pastor Craig's reminder this morning. Uh, that while there are always many debates going on in the church and people may be disagreeing on things, that ultimately we are called to be simple, authentic Jesus. To always keep Jesus Christ and Him crucified the main thing, the most important thing. To always remember that it is only Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. And to proclaim that to the world with our lives. Help us to be a unified church and help us to have a testimony of unity to the world in a very divided world. Lord, be with everyone here and online who's been listening this morning. Lord, if there are any burdens on their shoulders, I pray that you would encourage them this morning. Please be with us in this coming week, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week. You are loved. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I did. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. about you.